type of Jewish heritage because it's it's an amazing institution and it sits at a fabulous vantage point in New York. And if you haven't been to it, please put it on your list because it has both the perspective and the literal view of Ellis Island on one side and the Statue of Liberty on the other. And their whole goal is to honor the past and illuminate the future. And with that, they are a living memorial to the Holocaust. And we were members and quite simply, we were financial supporters of the museum. My dad was in an exhibit on uh, US military. He was in the Navy who were Jewish and fought in World War II. And I went to them one day and I said, I've got a crazy idea. I love to cook. I love to write. And as you're going to find out today, I love to talk about both of them. I don't know if you've got your calendars clear till about uh, midnight, but I could truly talk about this book until then. My kids say I sometimes follow people into restrooms to tell them about food, hope, and resilience. But um but happily, uh, Zoom has enabled me to speak to more people in a in a more discreet fashion. And I went to the museum and I said, I want to write a cookbook and I want it to benefit the museum and I will do all the work and you will receive all the proceeds. All you need to do is give me a list to get me started. Give me a few names of some of your members who you think would be comfortable speaking to me. I'll take it from there. And at the time that we wrote the book, and I say we because I did this with the help of over a hundred amazing survivors. And when we created this book, we printed a thousand copies. Our publisher was doing the work pro bono and our family uh, paid for the printings. And we said, I don't know, 500 copies, 700. Let's go big. Let's print a thousand copies. We have now sold 25,000 copies of wow. that book. 25,000 copies of books sold. Yes, 25,000. And all of the proceeds from those books have all gone to charity. And so this lovely kitchen that you might see behind me was the uh, the testing ground for all of my recipe testing but none of the proceeds go toward anything in that kitchen. They all go to support Holocaust related charities, which is why I will implore you when we're done with this talk, I hope you will embrace this book and continue to support it because it continues to do really good things for the survivor community. So I went to the museum and I now had to learn how to write a cookbook. I had never written one before. And I started by taking classes at the new school. For those of you who are familiar with New York, you'll know that it's a school that offers some interesting um, courses. And one of them was for first time cookbook writers. And my husband truly pushed me into going. And I thank him for that. And I took the class and I then set out to write this book. And I had my first interview with this wonderful woman. Her name was we lost her not long ago so may she be a blessed memory and Regina was my first interview and Regina came to my home and we sat at my dining room table and she told me her story and it was truly the first time that I had ever really had this kind of an interaction with a Holocaust survivor I had never I had heard them speak I had gone to exhibits but I had never had a one-to-one -one conversation. And I'm going to say that I'm assuming most of you have, and I'm sure that you all know it's life-changing because the stories that they share and the perspective that they have is truly so unusual. We are flustered and flummoxed with the smallest little things in our lives. And you speak to a Holocaust survivor and you hear what they've endured and how they have turned tragedy into triumph. And you realize 
that pretty much anything is possible. And Regina was no exception to that rule. And she told me her story and she told me about the people she lost and she told me about the amazing people she found. And we got through it. And you could see that when the story was finished, a smile returned to her face, her hands unclenched. And I said, Regina, now's the easy part. Share with me your signature recipe. And let me say that I do the absolute worst Eastern European accent on the planet. So my apologies to those of you whose names I am looking at and undoubtedly have these beautiful Eastern European accents. Mine sounds like the Muppet, the Swedish chef Muppet. I don't know if you remember him, but that's my accent. I'm going to do it anyway. And Regina said to me, uh, that's a signature recipe. And I said, Regina, it's the dish you make all the time for your friends and your family. And she says, well, Mamela, that, uh, that would be Bluski. And I said, okay. I get out my paper and I get out my pen and I'm very excited to begin writing her recipe. And she says, oh, Mamela, it's so simple. You take some potatoes and you mix it with some flour and uh, you have Kluski. And I looked at her and I said, you know, Regina, <laughs> maybe you'd have Kluski, but uh, somehow I don't think I'm going to have Kluski. Uh, are there eggs? She's going to cook the eggs. What do you think is going to hold it all together? And with that, I looked at her daughter, Evelyn, who was with me, and I was in a panic. And Evelyn said, don't worry, I speak Regina. And with that, she says, mom, when you go to the supermarket and you buy the potatoes, do you buy one potato? Do you buy two potatoes? And Regina says, no, sweetheart, I buy a bag of potatoes. And she says, and mom, when you buy the potatoes, are you able to carry the bag yourself? She looks over her shoulder like it was yesterday for me. And she says, well, last time I checked, there was nobody carrying potatoes for me. And she says, and mom, when you make the kluski, how many potatoes do you have left in the bag? At that point, I had known Regina for maybe 45 minutes, but I knew the answer to that question. She says, Mamala, I lived through the Holocaust. Do you think I would vase the single potato? And with that, Evelyn turned to me and she said, five pounds of potatoes. That is how every single recipe unfolded. I was given a recipe for half an eggshell of matzo meal. Is that a jumbo egg? Is that a medium egg? Well, I found out because I made that recipe over and over again, using a big eggshell, using a little eggshell, until I figured out what size eggshell was really the right one to convey the recipe. Now, many of you have recipes that have been handed down to you and, and the cook, and I use the term loosely, but the recipe preparer, they would say to you, use a glass of oil. And I am sure that some of you know that back in the day, that glass was a Yortzite glass. Now, those used to be these huge tumblers. Now, they're these tiny little votive candles. Well, that makes a huge difference in a recipe. So I took every single dish I was given and I made them and remade them over and over again so that I was sure that the reader of the book would be able to replicate the recipes exactly correctly. And after a year, my sainted husband, who's sitting so quietly in the next room, turned to me and he said, for one year, we have eaten like 80 year old Polish peasants. And I laughed and I said, what's so wrong with that? He says, nothing. He says, I am not complaining a bit. And we began to realize that what I was starting to call Holocaust food was organic before anybody knew what organic was. If it grew in the ground and it could keep in the cellar, they used it. Celery root and cabbage and all of these really wonderful ingredients that have now become so trendy. You go to a fancy restaurant now and they have uh, chilled beet soup with crumb fresh. 
it's borscht. They can call whatever they want. I went to a restaurant with my daughter in the West Village, and on the menu of the restaurant, toasted buckwheat groats with fafale pasta and caramelized onions. Now, they can call that whatever they like. Literally in my book, it's kasha varnishkas, and it's delicious, and it's wholesome, and it makes you feel really good inside. You talk about a warm hug, it's a warm hug. It's now become a trendy food. So the food that's represented in the book, it's not only your typical Ashkenazi dishes. I mean, of course, we have cauldrons of matzo bowl soup, and there is a recipe in there from one of our professional contributors for his uh, famous matzo bowl soup. They own the Blue Ribbon restaurants in New York, and the uh, the brothers gave me the recipe for both their soup and their matzo bowls. Now, I will add a caveat. Their matzo bowls are floaters, and I don't know how many out there of you are on team floaters or on team sinkers. I am on team sinkers, not by choice, but by hereditary, because my mother made solid matzo balls. She would drop those matzo balls into the soup bowl. I was waiting to hear the bowl crack when they hit the bottom of the bowl. And we used to laugh that her matzo balls were so dense and so stick to your ribs that we knew when Passover was over because we passed the first matzo ball that she served us. Now, very conveniently, it took about eight days. And therefore, it was just natural. We knew to celebrate Passover for eight days. That's how long my mom's matzo balls took to pass. But I digress. So I was given all these wonderful recipes for what I'm going to call typical Ashkenazi food. However, what I didn't expect and what I learned as I went along is that survivors found themselves in so many places, certainly not by choice, but by circumstance, I, I was able to learn recipes that came from the Dominican Republic. For instance, this dish, arroz con pollo. It was shared with me from a German survivor who found herself in Sisua. And in Sisua, she learned how to cook Latin American food. Now for her family, arroz con pollo, it's Jewish food. Why? It's prepared by a Jewish woman. For me, because Jewish food does not have an address, you can't throw a dart and say, that's the birthplace of Jewish food. We've been thrown out of all the best countries in the world. And so our food represents the cuisine from all of these places. Rosa, I don't know if Malta has a Jewish population and that there are Jewish foods represented there, but I bet you there are. We we do have some. I, I noticed that there are some um, in common with, for example, from Libya and from Spain. Makes there, there's sense. a lot of influence. There is a small Jewish community, but I think the recipes are way older. And they probably are because what I found even when I was speaking to my um, my uh, survivors from Greece and, you know, a lot of people don't realize they think of Poland, of course, and they think of Germany and Hungary and Austria. But by percentage, the Greek people suffered the greatest losses during the Holocaust and no different than what happened in Hungary when the war came to Greece and those who were fortunate were hidden by um, their Christian neighbors and many were aided by Turkey at the time who were an ally and, and helped many of them. But more than 90% of Greek Jews went straight to Auschwitz and like the Hungarian Jews, they were part of the, the true final solution. And, um, and they did not survive for very long um, in internment. And when I spoke to my Greek survivors, well, they're not really Greek. They're Sephardic. They're Spanish by origin. 
My father's family is Sephardic. My grandfather's family came from Spain. They were exiled and they settled in the Isle of Rhodes. And so, so many of the recipes that I got from my Greek survivors represent these wonderful Sephardic traditions. And in the book, there is a lentil soup that some balsamic vinegar just oozes to the top of the of the soup and adds this fabulous zing. And I was told so many times from my survivors from Greece that dill is is the herb of choice and it adds so much flavor. And if if you could bottle the essence of lemon zest and olive oil, it would it would take you to the Spartac community because those are the ingredients that really speak to their cuisine. And so the book represents so many different aspects of what I will call Jewish food, because it represents food from Latin America, from South America, from South Africa. And um, and Faith, thank you, because I'm going to say food is the language of our soul. It is what feeds us. And so I appreciate that it's resonating with you on that level, because this is what this is what our culture celebrates. It is the ability for Jewish people, even in times like what we are experiencing right now, to turn to the more traditional aspects, not necessarily the spiritual aspects and the religious aspects, but I'm finding that it's these communal aspects that bring us together as a community, especially during these challenging times, that help us heal. And that's what food did for Holocaust survivors. You know, I would go to their homes or they would come to mine and we would we would share a dish and it would transport them back to possibly the last Seder that they spent as a family. I remember eating Belgian endives with Cecile and Cecile was telling me how they saved her life. And I wondered how could a food be so integral to her story, but it was because she was a child and she was in Belgium and her mother just kept feeding her endives. And she got to the point one day where she couldn't take it anymore. And she said to her mother, I'm done, I'm leaving. And she wanted to go to the dance class that she was allowed to attend only several weeks earlier, but because they found out she was Jewish, she was no longer able to be a student. But her friend, who was not Jewish, was able to bring her as an observer. And she went to that class, storming out of her house. And when she came back after the class, feeling awful that she gave her mother such a hard time, a neighbor stopped her at the door. And she said, don't go in. She said, while you were out, your entire family was taken. Your home was destroyed. She never saw any of them again. And she said to me, a plate of Belgian endives saved my life. And she makes those endives with beer and a touch of sugar. And she says, I add the sugar as a nod to my mother because had they been sweet on that day, I wouldn't be here today. When you listen to stories about food in that context, and context has taken on some crazy meaning in our world in the last week. But for this, context is very clear. And when you take food in the context of what it means to a Holocaust survivor, I see my dear friend Paulette is listening. And Paulette shared with me several recipes. She was one of the first children to arrive in the United States she came over from France wearing a, a beret and looking perfectly fabulous and remains so to this day. And she shared the recipe for chocolate mousse that she remembers her mother preparing. Uh, not a typical Jewish dish, but her mother and father were survivors and they would prepare this mousse to remember the time that they were in France and how their lives were saved by finding refuge there. And by a salad that they called very fancy, salad de boeuf. And what was it? It was a salad made with kosher salami, but it's delicious. And it brings Paulette back 
to those times with her family and it would bring her mother back to times in her youth when she was a survivor finding refuge in France. And so a lot of people look at this book and they say, well, it's lovely. Isn't that sweet? This woman wrote this lovely book and she talks about all this food and it's a cookbook and I don't need another cookbook. I, I don't cook. I, I've turned my kitchen into a Pilates studio. Um, I used to cook for my grandchildren, but my granddaughter is now a vegan and my grandson only eats on odd days of the week. Well, it doesn't matter if you cook anymore because you read. And this is not a cookbook filled with stories. This is a storybook filled with recipes. And because of the stories, it is, yes, Rosa, it is a way to connect and keep our roots. No matter what your heritage is, no matter what your traditions are, maintaining the food that's the roots to a lot of our cultural identity. And for many of us, our Jewishness is expressed through that. So it's the stories in this book that I honestly think will feed your heart and soul. So I'll share with you one or two stories. The first, and I'll start with the food because I was told and I do digress a lot, so forgive me. But I, I speak in stream of consciousness and the train leaves the station. Sometimes it comes back and sometimes it's on a one-way journey. But hopefully it always returns. The food was the best food everyone has ever tasted. And that's because the word best when it comes to food has more to do with the association of the recipe than the actual ingredients. Without the story, a recipe is just ingredients. But when you put the story with the recipe, you add so much more flavor. That's the case with the Linzer tart cookies that you're looking at behind me. Because those Linzer tart cookies are something I make all the time. If you're a good baker, go for it right away. If you're a new baker, get a little experience under your belt because they are a little bit soft and very buttery, but that's what makes them delicious. So your refrigerator will be your best friend. But those are the best Linzer tarts I've ever had. And they're the best because they came from Mary Mayer. And Mary's story is a story that I think about on a regular basis because Mary taught me something. And hopefully hearing her story will help imbue you with the same lessons that Mary taught me. She greeted me at her home on a very nasty day. And I got there and I said, Mary, it's so wonderful to see you. And she says, oh, sweetheart, I am so sorry. I dragged you out in this terrible, terrible weather. And I said, oh my goodness, Mary, why would you apologize? She says, because I don't have a story to tell. Now, at that point, I had spoken to about 70 Holocaust survivors, and I knew without question that Mary had a story to tell. Three hours later, I left Mary's house with a wonderful story and a fabulous plate of Linzer tart cookies, my favorite cookie. And Mary told me about her childhood in Hungary. She came from a very privileged home. And in Mary's home, she was sent to a boarding school because she was so privileged that she had a governess and a cook and a private boarding school. And because the war came late to Hungary, Mary's family thought in 1944, safe to bring Mary home. And they did, and it was premature. And Mary's family was taken away. Her mother, very luckily, became under the protection of Raoul Wallenberg, her father, she did not see again. And Mary was given papers by her governess to show that she was a Christian child. And Mary took those papers. And if you know Budapest, it's separated. One side is the Danube 
uh, in the middle is the Danube and one side is Buddha and the other side is the Pesh side. And Mary went across the Danube River to the other side. And when Mary got there, she found work as a farmhand, girl that had a cook and a chef and a governess and all the other trappings of prosperity that she enjoyed in Hungary. But she was safe and she worked very hard. And she was there for a little over a year. And she said toward the end of that year, she was up in the attic and she looked out the window and she saw a truck coming down the street and she assumed that it was the Germans. So she went downstairs and in German, Hungarian child, in German, she said, welcome to our village. And in Russian, he answered her and he said, I'm not German, I'm Russian. I'm here to liberate this town. And in Russian, Mary answered him. And she said, I am Jewish, take me home. And Mary said, he hoisted her up onto the truck and he drove her to the edge of the Danube River. And the bridge had been blown apart. And I said, oh my God, Mary, what did you do? Without a moment, she said, sweetheart, it was okay. I waited for the winter and I walked across the frozen Danube. That's perspective. That's what we all need in our lives. That's what we need with what is going on today. That is what we need on our every day where we are annoyed and bothered by the most trivial things. A navigation that takes us to a dead end, an appointment that gets canceled, a dinner that doesn't come out well. Mary Mayer waited for winter and walked across the frozen Danube. That's what a Holocaust survivor can teach you. That's what my Holocaust survivors taught me. They taught me that you can go from comfort to chaos and comfort again. And I know that to be true. And anytime I've had something challenging in my life, I've remembered not just Mary's words, but so many of their stories, because that's what they can teach us. And I know many of you are intimately involved in the Holocaust survivor community. Many of you are second generation, possibly third generation. Maybe some of you are survivors yourselves. I hope you'll share that with me as, as we openly speak after the talk. And they have a different perspective than the rest of us. Celia Kenner, she was a child. She was seven. She was pointed out on a playground by her school friends who she played with safely days before. But a truck drove by with a bullhorn. We're looking for Jewish children. And her friends pointed to her. And she was placed in the back of this truck. And she began to yell at the driver. Why are you doing this to me? What did I do to you? Do you have children? Would you want them to do this to your children? He threw her off the truck. Saved her life. Because Lord knows where that truck was going. She ended up in the ghetto along with her aunt and her uncle and several cousins. Her mother was a beautiful woman and she never questioned what it is her mother did outside the ghetto. But she remained outside. And every now and again, her mother would sneak in and would give them information. And one night she came and she said to them, tomorrow night you hide because the camp, the ghetto is being liquidated. And Celia scrambled with her aunt and uncle and cousins to find hiding places and they all found one. And she said, I couldn't squeeze in, so I found my own. And with that night, she heard her aunt's voice in the street above all the noise. And she heard her call out, Celia, 
never forget, tell our story. She never saw any of them again. And her mother came the next morning, put her under a cloak, ushered her out of the ghetto, and took her to a farmhouse where she had found a woman who would take care of her. And Celia was in the back of this woman's home in a windowless room. She was safe and she was there for well over a year, closer to two, at which point a neighbor was hung for having hidden a Jewish child. And the mother of this family said to Celia, I cannot risk the life of my family. I need to move you. And her husband suggested an orphanage and that's what she was about to do. She says, I can't bring myself to that because I don't know it could be safe. So instead she took her to the barn and she said to her, I will bring food for the animals every third day. Do the best you can to survive. She says, and there is some rumbling on the top. I don't know what that is, but I hope you'll be safe. And Celia went into that barn and she climbed up those stairs and she got to the rafters and up in the corner was a woman cowering, shivering. It was her mother. She had been there for nine months, unbeknownst to the woman in the house. And she was dying. And every three days, Celia went down the steps, got the feed for the animals, and she and her mother ate that until they were liberated. And the two of them together walked out of that barn and they were reunited with her father and she lived a wonderful life. Mary taught me perspective. Celia taught me to speak up, to say something, to be an upstander, to not remain quiet, even if it's, dangerous, even if it could be the wrong decision, speak up because it saved her life. And two women, two women taught me the word that I think describes this book better than any other. And that word is beshert. Because this book is all about beshert. This story is about two women, two women from the same town in Poland, two women who found themselves together in Auschwitz, two women who were part of the only uprising to ever take place in a concentration camp, Ada Ehrlich and Nadia Bergson. And Ada and Nazia worked together to create an uprising. And how did they do it? They worked alongside another woman in the camp who recruited a group of women all from this same town to collect small deposits of munition, of gunpowder from the factories that they were working in. And these two women stood in the square of Auschwitz and Ada and Nadia watched the leader of their conspiracy hung in the center of Auschwitz, but she would not reveal a single name of the other women involved. And every day Ada and Nadia went to work and every day they brought back a little gunpowder and they deposited it in a vessel. And eventually they collected enough that they were able to create an explosive device. And they got it to the Sonder commanders who were the unfortunate Jewish men who were charged with running the crematorium. And they took this vessel, this bomb, and they blew up a crematorium. It never happened before and it never happened again. And Ada and Nadia survived Auschwitz together and they left. And one day, years later, they bumped into each other on the streets of New York City. I live blocks away from my friend Paulette. I live blocks away from my sister. And I can't tell you 
I could count on one hand the times we've ever just randomly bumped into each other, but they did. And they rekindled their friendship and they became each other's family. And Ada moved away. And Ada had a granddaughter, Jolie. And Ada's granddaughter, Jolie, went to college in Ithaca. And she began dating this lovely young man named Jason. And she brought him home for dinner one night. And in conversation, they discovered that he was Nadia's grandson. That's Bishert. One of them lived to see them married. Both of them knew they were dating and neither of them were there when Jolie gave birth to twins and she named one of them for Ada and one of them for Nadia. That's Bishert. I was meant to write this book. You were meant to tune in today and hear me talk about it. I hope you take this book of food, hope, and resilience into your hearts, into your homes. I hope you share it with others. I hope you buy it for gifts for every person on your list, whether it's for Valentine's Day, to bring to Passover, for a belated Hanukkah gift, for a beautiful Christmas present. This book needs to have these stories told and these recipes shared so we can support Holocaust education and we can honor the legacy of the Holocaust survivor community. That's what this group is all about. And I cannot thank you enough for listening. Wow. And I need some moments of just to let that sink in. So I'm just going to give that a minute just to waft through the air. And I want to also let everyone know that if you're not on camera, we don't see you. Uh, so I took out all the black tiles. So we have uh, more than 20 people with us, but only several have put themselves on the camera. This next part of the program is really, I think it would be great if as many people would come on so we could have an inclusive interactive session. I'm going to um, open it up for Q&A, but I have a couple questions that I want to ask first, and I really want to involve the audience. I have so many friends here with me, and we have one that's very close to my heart, and that's Ava uh, Maremi, and I want to introduce Ava to you. Ava is actually from Hungary. Her mother is a survivor. Okay, we're done. Ava wrote a book, oh, Ava oh, wrote a book called Hidden Recipes. I would recommend it to oh. everyone. And Ava, I would love to hear your impression of when you're hearing stories about Budapest. And I know that's a, such such a close and dear part of your life and your mother. Uh, please share something that you're thinking about now. Thank you. I think somebody needs to mute. Yeah. Uh, Diana, somebody. Diana, somebody. Diana yeah. you need to, you need to, okay, you just muted Adjusted. yourself. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jeffrey. And June, I... I just held back my tears through your entire presentation. You speak so beautifully. Thank you. And your, your stories are so just amazing stories. And it brings back memories. My mother, my family, on both sides, my grandparents were sent to Auschwitz. Both, side, both grandparents were murdered and my mother and her little sister survived because they were starving. My mother began to write, uh, not in Auschwitz, but in a munition factory in Germany where they had to work 12 hour days. And she was able to, um, she was able to pilfer some German paper with them on one side was the munition that was used to annihilate the Jews, and the other side was blank. And she also found a little pencil. And she began to write recipes in Hungarian, and she wrote over 600 recipes. Oh my Sa goodness. Saved them all. Um, 
the part of Austro-Hungary where my family lived became Czechoslovakia, first Czechoslovak Republic. But my parents were Hungarian speaking from Košice. We lived in Košice in Slovakia, uh, Kasha, and uh, spoke at home Hungarian. My mother and her sister went back to their family home with the recipes. And in 1971, my parents emigrated to United States and brought all the recipes out. And only when my parents passed away, I donated them to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC. And I did write the story of my parents, of my mother, and in the book, Hidden Recipes, and translated five or six recipes from Hungarian to English. But a lot of people wrote to me and complained, where, why didn't I translate the rest of the recipes? Well, it's a huge job. Yeah. And I wanted to tell the story. Not, I wasn't, I didn't mean to write a recipe book, but mm -hmm. tell the story of my parents. So thank you for what you have done, because this is so important. Well, you are you are so welcome, and I will tell you that there is a um, a chef. His name is Alan Shia. Do you know of him? I heard the story. Okay, so he has found he found a Hungarian recipe book. He translated it. He actually then began preparing dishes from it and sent it to the child of the survivors whose family's cookbook it was. And he has begun a project for the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum based on his rescued recipes. I'm actually, and I can send Jeffrey the link, I'm speaking at the Stryker Center, which is at uh, Temple Emanuel in New York City. And he and I will be talking about rescuing recipes for Holocaust survivors. And Eva, I think you'll find it especially interesting because he he works solely on translating Hungarian recipes. And um, it was the Fen uh, Fenvis family. His name is Stephen Fenvis. Fenvis. Um, yes. Fenvis. Um, and that's whose family's cookbook. It was their uh, cook who rescued the cookbook after they were taken to Auschwitz. And she preserved it. It found its way to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. They have raised now over $500,000 for the museum based on dinners that he is hosting and talks that he does on these Hungarian dishes. So it's something I think you would find especially interesting. I and may, talk, may I just, yes, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. May I just no, no, no. to it? So it was featured on TV, maybe CBS. Yes, it was. So when I looked at the video, as they walk, they are walking into the Holocaust Museum. On the video, you see a, pink paper handwritten recipe and that is one of my mother's recipes oh with my, my mother's goodness. handwriting i have to tell him that mm -hmm. because i speak to him all the time i would tell those of you who i know you're all on the facebook page if any of you are on instagram follow me on it because i talk about these things and i share things with chef uh alan shaya he has two restaurants in New Orleans called Saba and Safta. So he is truly committed to keeping Jewish food culture alive. And um, and I hope you'll you'll look for his work and um, and register for the talk. It's free and it's virtual as well as in person. And and I think you'd you'd enjoy hearing this. And maybe you can June put some information a little later in chat so people can find the program. Good thinking. And Eva, if you want to provide your contact information to June, that can be maybe something you want to consider sure. doing. I also Thank want you. to look at the program for questions now uh, for that, because uh, for the presentation that uh, June had, that's going to be part one. So if you are, the only way you can ask a question is we need to see you. Uh, so, or you, uh, so if you have a question and, and I see there's a hand raise here, Gabriella, please tell us where you're coming from, uh, and, um, you ask your question, please. Well, I'm currently in Washington state, uh, right across the river from, uh, Portland, Oregon. Diana knows exactly where I'm at. Um, I'm also Hungarian. Um, I was 
I'm from the other side of the of Hungary, though, on the Romanian border. Okay. Um, came to the United States in 1964. And uh, I just found it interesting when you were talking about the borscht. The first time I went to a a restaurant and they, it was, you know, a very fancy restaurant. And on the menu is polenta. And I right. said, okay, I'll order some polenta. It sounded so <laughs> wonderful. And when it came, it's what we call in Hungary, puliska. Okay. And the it was a meal that was served when you didn't have enough money left over for the month. To, to buy anything else because it was a very cheap meal. Right. And on this on this <laughs> menu, it was big bucks for it. Exactly. But yeah, I, I my mother, incidentally, Ava, is from Kasha also. That's all I had to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Rosa, go ahead. Um, June, I know that you were working on a audiobook version of of the book. Um, I, I was wondering whether you had plans to share more of these stories in audio as well. So because the, really, I, I I could have listened to you for hours. <laughs> Thank and you. The, you you really got the message across, and I think we we need more of it to preserve it in in different ways, so they're they're accessible to more people. Thank you. I I appreciate that. The the book that is out now, Food, Hope, and Resilience, is the updated book. And um, what's unfortunate is at this point, uh, I would say the majority of stories that I would be able to collect now would be coming probably from the children of survivors rather than from the survivors themselves. I was very lucky that I had, when I wrote the book, um, many of them were still in their 80s, some even in their late 70s. And I was able to you know, collect the recipes from the person who actually prepared it. But I, Rosa, I so I appreciate the comment. And um, I, I talk about these and I try to gather them wherever I can. There are um, on Instagram, I find that a lot of people post about survivors and there's a, a website called Humans of Judaism and she puts a lot of content out there. And so I try to call whatever I can and then repost things that relate to the stories and the food of Holocaust survivors. But um, it's it's getting in increasingly more difficult. Okay, so I'll ask you your question. Uh, even though your parents were not survivors, but they sound like they're very Jewish, <laughs> what is the favorite meal that you remember of your mother making? So my my mother was what I would have to call a very good holiday cook. We called her a yuntif maker. So she would make a fabulous brisket, a perfect roast capon, a delicious bowl of matzo ball soup, albeit with sinker matzo balls. And um, those are the foods I associate with my mother as being um, probably a perfect meal would be what I would call her Rosh Hashanah dinner. That would be a perfect dinner. My father, on the other hand, was an excellent gourmet cook. And my father on Sunday nights would make us, I think probably my favorite two choices were chicken livers a la Maurice. And I'm sure he is laughing right now. And he would make those with wine and they were just, and it was not a dish that you think most children would enjoy, but we love them. And he made a fabulous chicken a la king and he would stud it with pimentos and line the, the plate with with biscuits. And of course, neither of those are particularly representative of Jewish dinners, but my father was a very good gourmet cook and my mother was a very good, typical Ashkenazi cook. I mean, we had boiled tongue for dinner once a week and it would always come with a baked potato and cream spinach. That was the, that was the pairing, That's uh, that was the trifecta. It always had to have those other two things with it. And that's what I would associate with my mom. Okay, we're going to come back to that question. So Ruth and Mark, Ruth, go ahead. You have, make sure you unmute yourself and introduce yourself. Where are you from? And ask your question. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. Can. Hi, I'm calling in from San Francisco. Um, I want to just express my deep appreciation to June 
for her eloquence, her storytelling, and this point about perspective. Um, I'm second generation. Uh, our great grandmother died in Auschwitz and our grandmother was on the St. Louis and we have all the sagas. This is a family from the Rhineland Palatinate near France. Um, so my question is, I'm working myself on a, on a, on a book about called Oma Mina's Cheesecake. It's about the role that cheese, the cheesecake being our dish that we're still making today that was started by our great grandmother who perished. And I wonder, are there any cheesecakes in your book? And, uh, <laughs> Just again, yep. my, my deep appreciation. Thank you. And thank you for that. And good for you for getting, uh, putting pen to paper, even if you're using a computer, it's still pen to paper as far as I'm concerned. We have a recipe in the book for something called Baba's Dough and Cheesecake. And in my, um, the book that I released in February called Iconic New York Jewish Food, in that book, I have um, Junior's Cheesecake Recipe, which is uh, truly an amazing, an amazing cheesecake. And he got that recipe from his immigrant parents and grandparents. So it has a nice uh, longevity to that recipe as well. But I would love to try your grandmother's uh, recipe. I think that would be a, a real treat. If you want somebody to help test it for you, send it my way. I'd love to try it. Well, it's it's a, it's more of a, it has more of a souffle quality because the uh -huh. eggs, whites are beaten. It's not like the the Cheap, there's, there's no cream cheese in it. It's it's more huh. it's lighter and fluffier. But oh, I would, I would love, love to try it. Ruth. So <laughs> is there a way to reach you? Yes. So um, I can put, I'm going to type my email address in here now. And all of you can reach me at that address. And I hope you do. If you have additional comments or questions. And um, I'm also putting, it's at June Hirsch. And then I'm also putting my website because that's another source for you can buy the books on amazon barnes and noble walmart um if you purchase it from them that's wonderful i love it if you purchase it from me the only thing that i can do for you advantage wise is i can inscribe it to you so um it gives you that option and that you would be able to do on um on my uh on my website itself so, but I hope you'll reach out to me. I would love to be able to keep you in my fold and let you know about things. And if you are in other parts of the country, which I know many of you are, I travel. My husband and I, you have a living room or a synagogue or a Hadassah or a UJA organization. We have a talk. And that's how we sell 25,000 25, copies of the first book. So we would, I would love to come to your community, to your synagogue, to your group and give a book talk. So feel free to email me if, if that sounds interesting to any of you. So Ruth, I wanna just add on, my mother uh, was from Kosice, Czechoslovakia, and she made an amazing cheesecake. It took me years as June was articulating, my mom never baked with a recipe. Um, she made something like 250 different types of um, baked goods. I've now wow. done 50 of those from scratch, similar to what, and these recipes are now appearing on jcrnow.com, which I just put into uh, chat. And my mom's cheesecake recipe is there. All you have to do is ah. search for it and you'll find an amazing, and she used egg whites for the top. And she do she used a ricotta, cottage cheese, mm -hmm. and cream cheese ah. for light as a feather. And I make that on every special holiday. My mom mm -hmm. used to make it on my birthday every year. So I want to go to Mark. Mark has your hands up. Go ahead. First of all, June, I loved your presentation. And what I love most about it is you are so positive and enthusiastic. And I, that's something I think that we really have to capitalize when we speak to young people, uh, particularly. I will share with you one thing. Um, when I was a kid, it was always a mystery to me why as much money as my parents had and other parents had, my mother always carried aluminum foil in her pocketbook. And anytime we went to a bar mitzvah or a wedding, 
all of these wonderfully dressed women with diamonds and pearls and all the rest <laughs> would suddenly open up their pocketbooks <laughs> and the fish would disappear into the pocketbook. They run off to their rooms or their bungalows and then they'd come back and you would hear, oi, so there's no food. <laughs> That's great. The other thing that I always will remember about my mom, I was actually born in a displaced persons camp in Germany. Uh, two years and one day after mom was freed from Auschwitz and my father was freed from Buchenwald. But I never really understood so much about my own childhood, childhood because they never really spoke to me, okay, about what happened. But one thing I always remember is the story of the last Kuskala. I don't know if you've ever heard that one. Yeah. Well, the last Kuskala was the last crumb of bread or the last piece of cake or the last piece of canned Franco-American spaghetti and meatballs that if I didn't eat, all the children of Europe would starve to oh, death. Oh, sure. Yes. Yes. And I never understood that <laughs> until I learned about the Ludge Ghetto when I wrote my books. So all I can say is your positivism is inspiring. And thank, thank you. you very much for what you're speaking to us today. I appreciated it. Thank you. I appreciate that. I When you have something, uh, I I always I liken the two things. I say there are two things I can talk about with passion. One are my grandchildren. The other is this book. And I think when you feel so strongly about something, I'd like to think that that is how it is conveyed. And um I I didn't know at the beginning if people would almost be put off by the fact that there was some humor in the conversation in the talk, but we laughed more than we cried when I wrote this book. And I think that's one of the, the hallmarks of those survivors who are able to talk about it, because not all of them are, but the ones who can, um, you know, the, the Sammy Steigmans of the world are, are able to look at this and put it in the right box and understand how to live with it and the fact that they at this point they can't live without it and it, they've made it part of their mm -hmm. their life but it, not in a way that it is haunting but in a way that it is teaching and that's that's the important thing that we need to do right now and i agree with you especially with this next generation coming up so thank, thank you for that mark thank you well i am going to uh, transition and move sort of into this next uh, part of our program which is to yes. really Go ahead. Excuse me, Jeffrey. Uh, Mr. Steigman is raising his hand. Okay, I'll get you a second. So we're, you're going to, I'll include you, Sammy, just a second. Um, we're going to do uh, something we've never done in the program before, which is to do a little bit of an interview uh, series with, uh, I'm asking questions of, of June, but these questions are also going to be asked for everyone in the audience. And I would love for each of you to pick up the answer uh, after June speaks. And I think it'll be quite interesting to see a collective um, where this all goes. Never done it before, and it'll be the first. So I want to uh, ask, before I get to you, Sammy, I want to ask everyone, the question I asked Judith, uh, June was, what was your favorite parents, mom and dad, or both, recipe that it was made? I'll start with you, Mark. All right. I, I am so sorry you started with me. My mother was not a cook. She was surviving as an immigrant in this country with a terrible marriage that basically was because of the fact that she wanted to get out of Europe. But I will tell you this. When I married my wonderful wife, Linda, who happens to be a, a, a Brit, she decided one day to cook for me matzo ball soup. And when I tasted it, my mouth was on fire. She had put oregano into the matzo ball soup. So I called my mom and my mom dragged out two chickens, two big pots, all the vegetables. And she taught Linda how to make her matzo ball soup. So the answer to your question is matzo ball soup with matzo balls that floated. Very good. Now, Sammy, I want to ask you about your mom. What was the uh, dish that you remember your mom did? And after you answer that, you can ask June the question. Uh, 
Hi, everybody. Uh, I grew up in uh, Transylvania. Okay, so obviously my mother used to make uh, chulen, uh, you know, Wiener uh, schnitzel that they were used to because it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and uh, the Jews adapted to the uh, German culture. But interestingly enough, I don't know if uh, June heard about it. And when I talk to the uh, students and uh, I talk about food, I say that mother's food has an ingredient that nobody okay, can duplicate. And I ask the kids what it is, and it takes a while for them to say one word, and that is love. Uh -huh. So no, uh, my mother used to make something that I could never stop eating. And that was, I, it's a loose translation. I don't know if June heard about it. It was primarily, as far as I know, in Bukovina. Uh, and it was called, in Yiddish, Tulsa uh loose English translation like uh, false fish. It used to, was made from chicken breast, okay, like meatballs. And you could eat it, okay, hot, or you could eat it whole, uh, cold. And I had many people that used to make that particular dish. They were from Chernovitz, from Bukovina. They made it, but somehow it was good, but somehow it was not my mother's <laughs> dish. And that was called the uh, loose translation. I don't know if June has ever heard. And by the way, I know June, okay, because June was part of a book called Still Here. Okay, uh, Brian Marcus, uh, okay, photographed about 157, yes, 157 survivors and liberators. And June Hirsch interviewed everyone, and she was able to pick up a quote that she felt that represents that particular person. And uh, I'm very honored that uh, June is part of my life. Oh, June, Thank you, Sammy. Quote? So no, this is Sammy. Yeah. This is that's Sammy in the you, book. And Sammy's quote? quote is, you cannot respect anyone unless you respect yourself. My parents taught me and I teach young people that once you respect yourself, you will be willing to accept and respect <sighs> other people's opinions and cultures. Because of this attitude, I have never felt like a victim. That's what you said, Sammy Steigman. All right. So Thank you. Diana, if you can unmute yourself, I have a question for yeah. you. Yeah, but June, have you heard of that particular uh, so dish? Was it was it like a croquette made with ground chicken? Oh, uh, I, I, I have no, I, I have no unmute idea yourself. because I don't know how to cook. Because my mother would make that, and there is a recipe in the book for taking chicken breast and making it like a meatball, but forming it into a patty. They would add eggs, a little onion, and matzo meal, and that's how you would eat it. And you could Adele, eat it warm or you could eat it cold. Adele, add your voice. Unmute yourself, please. So my mother made that all the time. She made everything. I don't have one single recipe. Her food was Tom Gun Aiden, if you know what that means. The taste is though you're in uh, heaven. Um, and she made the uh, false fish for those who didn't like gefilte fish. Huh. So whenever okay. there was gefilte fish, she'd make the false fish as well and make it exactly the same way, except use chick ground chicken instead of fish. Well, so that's basically that. I think that that is very similar to the recipe that's in the book because it's shaped almost like um, like a quenelle, like a gefilte fish patty would. Um, a kind of oval and thick, and you could poach it like you would gefilte fish. And I, I have to assume false fish means fake fish, basically. Right. And so it's, it's you know, kind of like a mock gefilte fish. And there is a recipe in the book. I'll, while somebody else is talking, I'll look it up but I and see where that person was from. So yeah. you my, just one second, if you don't mind. My, my parents came from Lviv, Lvov, Lemberg. Um, I was actually born there as well. We didn't make it to the States till the late 1950s. And as I said, everything she made was 
unimaginable, but the one thing that even friends, even my boyfriend from junior high school, she still calls me on, on Hanukkah or Halatkis. I yeah. don't know how she did it. Like 50 of them in 50 minutes just graded so fast. I can't imagine any sports person competing with her. And every single one of them was beyond imagination. And I'm a, a lot of people think I'm a very good cook, but I cannot, I don't, I've stopped trying. I cannot come close. And what was your mom's favorite recipe? What was your favorite recipe of your mom's? Everything. Well, I mean, I we ate things that nobody could imagine, haladets or pita, you know, which now I wouldn't take, I uh, wouldn't taste by the time. And we literally came from so such a modest background that you know my father sucked on the uh, uh, fish uh, heads, um, you know, all the livers, lungs, all that stuff was normal. Okay. And everything had garlic, okay. unless she baked. Okay. That's it. <laughs> Ruth, um, um, Diana, I want to, uh, I'm sad that your mom couldn't make it with us. Ruth has been, uh, Ruth Lindemann is a survivor, but she's just going to be 91, I believe, is that right? And uh, she comes to almost every program, so I'm sad she's missing this. But I wanted to ask you, what you what's your favorite dish of your mom? Well, I was trying to think of, of one. Um, she went when she got married at 18 they never taught her how to cook um so she either overboiled the vegetables she tried june she tried to feed us tongue and liver mm. that wasn't going to work maybe with the cream you know spinach or something yeah, or the baked that potato a lot. that might have worked but we made many trips to the bathroom you know getting rid of it <laughs> so um but she did finally learn how to make roast beef and, the, yeah. and we didn't have to tease her that it would be a doorstop later. She's not on the program, right? Okay. So um, she did it's finally recorded. learn how to do that. I just want to let you know, Ruth, that Linda's, <laughs> it's recorded, Diana, so just be careful. <laughs> anyway, yes, her roast beef turned out to be one of the best things that we liked. So we always look forward to that one. Okay. And I want to ask um, Gabriella what you, I want you, every, can you can, all of you can unmute so I can talk to you. And uh, Gabriella, what was your favorite mother's dish? I've been sitting here trying to think of what was. I'm <laughs> I'm like Adele. I, I loved everything my mother cooked. She she became an extremely good cook. Um, didn't start out that way, from what I understood from her, but she became an extremely good cook. But I have to say that probably her chicken soup with the floating matzo balls. Lucky you. And Jackie, I, I don't know. Quiet, first of all, I want to take Jackie and unmute yourself. I want to introduce you to Jackie. Jackie is a survivor from Tunisia. Uh, she interviews um, Middle Eastern survivors for the U.S. Shoah Foundation. Very uh, huge participant in all of our programs, literally everyone. And I know that you, uh, I can't believe you haven't raised your hand yet, but if you don't have a question, that's fine. But I want to ask you your mom's, what your mom's favorite, your favorite dish of your mom's. What is a chicken soup? What do you have need the matzo ball in there? <laughs> <laughs> if we had the potato. <laughs> okay, what I'm trying to say, it's it's very interesting to see how it's all around Ashkenazi food. And my mother was not a cook. I will tell you why she was not a cook. First of all, she had a very small kitchen in our apartment, but she had the maid she had somebody to help her cook. She had somebody to help her smell or taste the food to see if it was go good. And she was there saying, clean that, peel up that, peel up that. That means, and food was so, such a directive in our life. And not only with the testing. And I, and I, 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 I apologize because it, all those memories came back from the Sephardi world. God forbid when you are a child and you are sitting at the table and you are sitting at the table and the food is served if you test it before your mom or if you unfold your napkin before your mom does. That means for me, it was a very, very interesting. Thank you very much for, for doing this presentation because oh my goodness, you, brought, you brought me into my world and uh, 
and what I remember personally is not so much the food, but it was the culture and the education around the food. Yes. And the, if I may stay just a little bit longer, I was sharing that with my granddaughter yesterday and my grandson who are 12 years old. And uh, I was saying that every Friday night dinner, where the table is very nicely put together, blah, 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 and then there's good food and couscous or kaila or whatever, uh, we had on the right of our plate a little cone of newspaper, you know, like when you, and inside were nuts. And each kid and each adult was receiving the nut. But the kids had their cones with the nuts only if they behaved during the week. If not, it was missing. That means it was obvious for everybody. <laughs> Jackie, <laughs> didn't behave. Jackie didn't behave for me. Thank, thank you for making me laugh because it's a long, long time that I didn't laugh uh, with what's good. happening in the world. That means, and and my 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 nephew say my grandson says, but that's not fair. I do you telling me that his brother got the nuts and you did it? And I say, no, he didn't get them. He say, why? I say, because I punch him and just after dinner and I stole his coat of nuts. <laughs> and I he wonder. went to complain to my parents. That means it, it was really very cultural and again you you brought you know with the situation of today i didn't laugh for a long time like any yes. of us but <coughs> put that back and thank you for that thank, thank you. you so faith i see that you've asked a question please come on so we can see you ask that question i also going to change the question around a little bit and i'll say to jackie your daughter is yale what is her favorite dish of yours yeah, El, what the? I don't know. No the same question. No to idea. No idea. It. First of, I am not. A, I'm not a cook. Uh, that means I, I take things, put them in the microwave uh, blah, 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 in ten minutes, and oh, my yeah. husband say it's delicious. I say good. <laughs> All right, Adele, you're a cook, so tell us what your what your children are their favorites. You have to unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, Adele, please. Sorry. Um, I have to say chicken soup. And my grandchildren, who are Israeli and totally Sephardic, uh, is the one thing they love, 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 is chicken soup with matzo balls all year round. Otherwise, they're eating hot peppers and, you know, what? just totally Sephardic food. But chicken soup is in. <laughs> all right, and I'll ask Ruth your if you have if you first of all I should I want to make sure that it's not appropriate if you have children what is your favorite what is their favorite dish of yours? I don't have kids. I'm I but so I could speak as the child I was. Okay, go ahead. Near Geneva, Switzerland, our father was the German Jewish grandson of the grandmother who died in Auschwitz. His wife, our mother, was English and not Jewish, and he couldn't stand the English cooking, the skills she had. So he invited his mother, the one who was on the St. Louis, to come from, from the U.S. to teach her how to cook his German Jewish cooking, because that was the one thing he had still had from his childhood. So we grew up eating, you know, um, sauerbraten and red cabbage and um, fruit tarts, um, wonderful apple charlotte, linzer tort. So all those German Jewish dishes that are also Alsatian dishes were dishes of our childhood because food was the one thing that they could take out of Germany, really. Okay, and, and Ava, what is your children's favorite dish? And then I'll ask you, Diana. <laughs> My children, they well, they also like chicken soup, but they also like Hungarian food. Um, and Shavuot is one of our favorites when we make when we don't make meat because on Shabbat we always have chicken or something else. And they love even the Hungarian, the simple noodle with uh, puppy seed or uh, something that we call. Or, uh, the, the cheese dumplings with a farmer cheese, round dumplings fa with farmer cheese or dumplings with um, plums inside. 
So we have a recipe in the book for that. I had never heard of that before. And uh, they're, uh, I'm going to say it wrong, knodles. And it has, we either put a plum or a, or a small peach inside. It was delicious. And then the woman who gave me the recipe had me, I don't know, did you fry the dough? She then would drop the dough in hot oil and fry the dough. No, we drop, I fill it with the plum. I fill the dough with the plum, drop it in boiling water. Okay. When it comes up to the top, it's done. And I fry the breadcrumbs in oil. And then uh -huh. I, I take okay. it out and put it in the bre fried breadcrumbs. It was wonderful. My big fear was that I was going to take a bite and break a tooth on the pit. So I said to her, you have to take the pit out. She, she says, no, I leave the pit in. No, no, no <laughs> pit. No, no pit. I, it seemed a little crazy to leave the pit in, but that is how she did it. So, yeah. Jan, let me ask you what your children enjoy the most from your cooking. So it's, it's um, my children growing up, I, I, I cooked a lot of Jewish food and a lot of eclectic food, but I'll skip ahead a generation and go to my grandchildren and say that they are all about, and we seem to be focused on matzo balls, but all about matzo balls and meatballs. But so much so that even my grandson for visiting day at sleepaway camp, my daughter had to send up to camp a container of my matzo balls for him to have at lunch on visiting day at camp. But there's a recipe that is in my family, my Sephardic side. It's, um, we call them matzo meat cakes. And it is probably the dish that I am best known for. That and my Russian cabbage soup. So my Ashkenazi Russian side, I make a cabbage soup that is so sour. Oh, do you pucker. And you add more lemon even after you do. And it's filled with short ribs and hot dogs. <laughs> and it's my father is probably drooling right now. And then the other dish comes from his uh, his grandmother, my gran my great grandmother Esther, and it were they were um, meat cakes that you would soften the matzo with egg, almost as if you were making a matzo bride, but a whole piece of matzo, and you would sandwich between it some beef that had been ground beef that had been simmered for a long time, well over an hour with a little broth and lots of onions, caramelized onions. And you make a sandwich of that, you cover it in olive oil and egg on the top and you bake it in the oven. Um, it, it is a little labor intensive, but it is, it is I'm gonna say the dish that I am probably most known for and that my family um, would not let me through the door at a Jewish holiday if I don't have a tray of those uh, with me. So it's uh, my matzo meat cakes. Okay, so I'm going to uh, tell two stories. The stories uh, will hopefully stimulate stories in all of you. Uh, one of them, it can be either a positive story that you remember or a negative story that you remember growing up about your family and your cooking. My mom was a terrific cook, and uh, I invited my, my uh, college roommates to come home for the weekend, three of them. And they came, one of them was so excited to come home. And my mom was doing all of the baking, cooking, putting out a spread that was her typical feast. And this one uh, guy, his name was Avi, said to me, why are your, why do your mom's pots always look uh, silver? I said, what are, you, what are you talking about? Always look silver. He said, well, my mom's pots are always black. And your mom's doesn't taste burnt. <laughs> Everything I've had for the weekend is not burnt. Everything my mom makes is burnt. So that's one story. The second story was it's interesting, which what I was thinking about is you were talking about these uh, 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 kreplas. My mom made kreplas with cabbage hmm. and put it in the oil. And, I, and it was like a pierogi, but she would call it a noodle cabbage. I hated it. And my father, who both of them were Holocaust survivors, wouldn't allow me to leave the table without eating everything that was on the plate. So I refused to eat. So I was sent into the I was sent into the cold back room until I ate it. So I never ate. I never ate. And I spent a lot of time <laughs> in that cold back room. So again, I'm going to hold it out the question for each of you. To, do you have a story similar, good stories, bad stories, 
about growing up with your parents cooking? My mother, my mother used to make sour pickles. Oh, yeah. Unbelievable. I went to the best restaurants that you can think. Nothing close to it. Unbelievable. I don't know how she did it. She made it. It took, I think, about nine months or whatever to come to have that particular flavor. But it was absolutely amazing. And I can't uh, re replicate. I can't uh, tell you what was so special about it, except that my mother made it. <laughs> That's all it needs. <laughs> Jackie, go ahead. I, I am a little bit like June. I, I speak too much. I apologize, yeah, June. And it's a, it's a little bit an extension of what you are saying. I love my aunt. Her name was Alice, and she was used to do the best tomato sauce you can believe in the world. That She was absolutely incredible. She was very ignorant. She spoke only uh, uh, Arabic. She was uneducated. She had few words of French. And uh, her husband was used to call her by the timing from his office, by the timing the tomato sauce was almost ready. And on the phone, he was telling her, you are missing some salt. She said, are you sure? She says, yes, yes, you are missing salt. But he was talking to her over the phone, not tasting the tomato sauce. And she said, OK, I will add salt. <laughs> and another one there. And thank you for bringing all those memories back. I can see her. And she said, he said it's missing salt. That mean I have to put salt. Was he usually right? Did she undersalt things? It, it was the best tomato sauce that you could find. You know, yeah. we were just putting it on bread, you know, and no pasta or whatever. Yeah. But it's it's very funny that, <laughs> and I, I want to say thank you to you and to Jeff, really. Oh, it's, uh... Thank you. Uh, June, did you have a recipe for schmaltz? Yes, so we have a recipe for schmaltz in the book. <laughs> and I will say I that... love it. Right, schmaltz and what grimace. Schmaltz? My father used to love, he would take the ribbonas and the schmaltz and spread it on bread and right and it just just loved it i mean it's a cardiologist nightmare but it is it is really i mean we have a recipe somebody mentioned pacha we have a recipe for pacha in the in the book and there's a funny story because the recipe was given to me the book also has about uh two dozen recipes from professional chefs because i reached out to some truthfully, to help take the burden off my having to make every dish. And I also thought it would give the book an interesting um, element and maybe help promote it if we were having trouble promoting it. So chefs like Ina Garten and Mark Bittman and Michael Salomonov and um, Arthur, you know, uh, uh, Arthur Schwartz, who gave me his pacha recipe and his Gribbena recipe. And when I was making the pacha, I was cooking it in this kitchen and my husband came down the stairs and he said, um, oh my God, we're going to have to sell the house. The kitchen smells so awful. <laughs> and so I picked up the phone and Arthur had given me his, um, his cell phone and I called him and I said, uh, I know you're the Jewish food maven. He had been on New York radio forever as the Jewish food maven. And I said, but Arthur, something has gone terribly wrong. It smells like an animal has died behind my stove. And he said to me on the phone, he says, oh, then it's ready. And <laughs> that was, that's how, that's how you know Pacha is ready to serve. And the only person who would taste that recipe for me, because there was no way I was going to taste it, happened to be my father, who is um, a gourmet cook and a gourmet eater. And I brought it over to his house and I said, Dad, it's gray and it's jingly and it's disgusting. And he says, oh, no, it's not. I love it. And he he put the onions on top of it and he devoured it. So he was my 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 mother was my worst taster. Um, she had a, a comment about everything. She uh, she actually told me that one of my cookies crumbled in her mouth. And I said, well, you know, mom, there is actually an expression. Uh, that's the way the cookie crumbles. It's supposed to crumble. She says, no, I think it crumbled too fast in my mouth. So my mother was very, very particular about her food. On her last day on this planet, my father um, made her duck for dinner. And when I spoke to her that day, 
Um, I said, how was dinner? And she says, oh, your father worked so hard. He made me duck. And, th and I'm going, God, you're a lucky, lucky girl. She says, you need a little more salt. So she was, she was a, a hard audience. My father was an easy audience because he eats anything and everything. So he was probably my, he and my brother-in-law were my chief tasters. How old is your father? My dad is uh, the youngest 97-year-old person you'll ever want to meet. He, beautiful, beautiful. he makes all of us look um, elderly. He cannot stand old people, which is probably why he's not uh, showing his face because he really doesn't like to see old people or talk to old people. Um, and Wait at 97, a minute. Wait a minute. Right? Are you, are you accusing us of being old? Well, you know, we're <laughs> of a certain age. And uh, my father really just, uh, he is the youngest 97-year-old on the planet. So, What's your father's name? Murray. Murray, get on the, get on the camera. <laughs> we want to see you. And you, and uh, you Abriel, have to say... Abriel, unmute yourself and tell us what you have in mind. <laughs> and you have to say poo 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 in Kanina Hora when you say his age. Right. Okay. There you go. Oh, no. He's going to, I feel he's going to outlive us all. So. Anyway. Gabrielle, you're next. Unmute yourself. Okay. I just did. Uh, um, Adele, Adele, I did, I did not hear poo 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 a long time. I poo poo poo. <laughs> <laughs> I'll spin it everything. Poo. To the left side. Oh, the to the left side. side. I never knew there was an orientation to this. Okay. <laughs> I'm leaning right lately, but I will poo 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 to the left side. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, can I say something? Oh, wait uh, a second. Gabriel uh, taking, is taking, uh, and I'm Hold sorry. On a second. Jackie, Gabriel has a question. We'll come to you in a second. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I was just going to say the uh, when you mentioned Schmaltz, um, I served in Germany for three years. And I took some of my soldier oh. co-workers to Chris Kringle Mark, and they served Schmaltzbrot. And yeah. they they loved it. They ate it. Oh, this is so good. And then I told them what it was, and they almost gagged. <laughs> it's actually better for you than butter and then many oils. It actually, because you can always tell what um, type of um, fat is healthiest because they liquefy at room temperature. And so if you take a container of, um, I usually use empire chicken fat. If you take empire chicken fat out of your refrigerator, it will begin to become that liquid gold very quickly. That is actually the sign of a very healthy fat. It's so not really was, all that bad for you. Father was born in Berlin and my mother was from Czechoslovakia. When they married, my father always wanted my mother to make all the German food. Now, if you think about Hungarian versus German, my mother refused to make my father any of the German food. Yeah. And so he always was begging my mom for sauerbrot and, and the stinky cheese, Limburger cheese. So I can understand your point of, of the German. Thing. So go ahead, Jackie, you're up. I think I forgot. <laughs> uh, anybody, anybody remembers Kishke? Anybody had Kishke? Sure. Yeah. yeah. My mother used to make it. It was of delicious. Course. I loved it. <laughs> I just I want to I, tell. I, I forgot. As, to... as long as you don't know the ingredients. Right. Well, <laughs> you know, the ingredients, are, it's really the casing that puts everybody off. Right. I mean, right. right. If you don't use a large intestine, <laughs> the lining. <laughs> in, in iconic New York Jewish food, I actually have a recipe for kishka because it's really just stuffing. And if you put some nice brown gravy on it, you you can you can stuff it into pretty much anything. So if you go without the actual intestine, it's not so awful. So Ava, you were going to say something? No, I was just going to say that I forgot to mention that my mother did make falsa fish, and she ground the chicken breast, but she added some ground walnuts to it. Oh, and it was delicious. It was so good. <laughs> And Rosa, you said that you uh, you would make uh, whatever that it was. Uh, the kishka, you said kishka. We say kirsha, and the accent has an sh sound. It's the same. It's it's uh, stuff, stuffed with with the intestines. Okay, so I have again another question for all of you. When you brought your husband home or your significant other, do you remember the food your mother made for that meal? 
So go ahead, um, June. Oh, we'll I'm positive, and he's in the other room. My uh, so my mother made she made two roast beefs. Right, she made two roast beefs because she wanted to hedge her bets, and um, that's what we had. We had uh, roast beef for dinner the night that I, I, my husband adored my mother, and I'm convinced he married me because he felt I was very similar to her. And um, she never lived to see this book in print, but she knew about it. And on the last night that my mom was here, I was able to call her and tell her that the New York Times was reviewing the book. Great. And that was the last conversation that we had. And I remember feeling, looking back on it, that I'm so grateful that I was able to share such good news with her about the book. But she was such an optimist that I think she just was prescient and would have known that the book would have a, a life of its own and that it would hopefully make a difference. And, um, and okay, what I, were the I wish so if it. you knew there were two roast beasts, what were the sides? Oh, the sides. My mother always made the same sides with almost everything that she made like that. Baked potato and cream spinach. It was just, it was a given. Those were her her go-tos. And um, and I think my dad can confirm that it was she was a big baked potato and cream spinach girl. Okay. Mark? When I brought my wife home to my mother, my mother served different kinds of fish with the heads on them, the eyes on them, and the chicken with the neck. And everyone was fighting for the neck and for the <laughs> eyes. And afterwards, <laughs> my wife, I said to my wife, did you eat anything? She says, can we please go to McDonald's? <laughs> <laughs> I agree with your wife. I can't handle that. Uh, no. no. Oh, and I, I will tell you, my mom made a chillant once. And I, she cooked this thing for like two days. I had never seen her make anything like this before. And I asked her, I said to her, what kind of meat is this? And she says, why do you ask me what kind of meat this is? And I said, ma, I've never tasted meat like this. And she says, it's horse meat. <laughs> yeah. So I never asked my mother again for any of her ingredients. <laughs> Great start. Great start. All right. Anybody else I want to contribute? To... Go ahead. I, 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 I don't know. Okay. Um, Diana, I was just thinking about what you have done. Hold on a second. And again, I don't. I, Jackie. I don't Jackie. relate to to food very much because I Jackie. grew up with. Jackie, stop. What? Diana's next. She's... Oh, la, la. Diana, can I be first? Um, I'm teasing. Just... I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm not going to. I didn't get to answer the uh, question before. My dad um, used to do his special Sunday breakfast. And us as kids, it was like, oh, my gosh, my mom's not cooking. So um, his his favorite thing to do was to do hash browns, eggs, and bacon, but mix it all together. And he said they used to eat that when they were growing up. I don't know if that was true or not, but it was something that was like, ooh, ah, we get to eat something from dad. And he also made a really good. Um, uh, that, <laughs> that's my father's a, a good, dog, really good I believe. Clam, <laughs> a really good clam chowder as well. When we we have a beach house, and um, that was that was another good favorite because we could. It was nice and thick, and so and you, uh, those were the two your, things that he made the best. And he actually not? hand wrote the recipe, and I still have the, the clam chowder recipe. So that was pretty cool. When you brought your fiance or you brought your husband home to to your house, what what did they make? What did your mom make? Actually, they had him cook because he um, made Thai food. So um, they were really open to that because it was something different. So he did the cooking. Very interesting. Anybody else? Now, Jackie, go ahead. I, I, I married, they are personal stories, but it doesn't matter. I feel like uh, I married a non uh, uh, Nashkenazi guy and Sephardi, and I am Sephardi. And on, as you know, uh, on Thursday, you go to the synagogue. On Friday night also, you are invited by the family of the bride. And on Saturday, you are invited by the family uh, of uh, the chosen. And uh, we go for this Ashkenazi dinner, 30, 40 people <laughs> from, from the Sephardic origin, from Tunisia. And uh, we don't understand very much the matzo ball soup, 
that's fine. And after that, we serve the gefilte fish and we all look at each other. Not me, of course, because I was more educated. And my aunt and said, what is that? I say, eat, eat and be quiet. Eat, eat, it's very good. That means they eat the gefilte fish. And after that, we have the brisket. Why why your brisket on Friday night? It's not so exceptional, but whatever, on Saturday night. And at the time of living, <laughs> at the time of living, my father turns towards David's uncle and say, you are a hoya. A hoya, which means in Arabic, you are my brother. You became my brother, being in David didn't have his father. But it seems that in Yiddish or in Polish, it's a very dirty word <laughs> that I will not say, but very, very <laughs> extreme oh, really? word. Oh. That means the guy becomes insane. And my aunt, my aunt comes next to him and he says, you know, your wife has been so nice and she has done so much for us. She must be so exhausted that she forgot to fry the, the fish. <laughs> I think Diana has figured out how to unmute. Diana, give it a try. Who is? Yes. Yes. No. Diana, are you there? She texted me and said she thought she figured it out. Okay, maybe not. So I want to ask Ava when you went home to your, uh, when you brought your fiance home to visit your mom and father, what was that? What did she make? My mom, so I, I mentioned that he likes ground food with ground beef. He's he's Sephardic. So I said he likes ground beef. So my mom made ground chicken, what in Hungarian is called fashirozot. Fashirozot, right? Gabriela is nodding. And uh, it's ground chicken and it's fried. Well, my husband just looked at it and said, what is this? He, he, but then he ate it and he liked it. Um, and okay. then okay. down the road, my mom made for him all kinds of things that he liked, or for all of us, uh, roast beef and uh, Wiener schnitzel and all kinds of stuff. He got to use, he got to like the Ashkenazi food. Okay, and I'll ask uh, Adele and Gabrielle to weigh in if you want to. Just unmute yourself. When you brought your when you brought your husband home, what did your parent what did your mom make? My my mom um actually was at my sister's house and it was a Seder. So everything that ever came from a shtetl in Galicia was there. And we could have invited, like, as I always say, I'm very bad at math, and that comes from my mother. If five people come, we cook for 15. If 15 people come, we go right for 50. You know, because what if? You know, they're <laughs> survivors. You never know. Um, and that's how I live my, my life as well. Even though my husband actually, he, he's from survivors too, but they have have a very different approach because they only shop for the day because what if? Okay, and Gabrielle? I, I skipped all of that. As I mentioned, I, I was in the military and that's where Good I place. met my husband. And he didn't meet my parents until we were getting married. So we didn't have any of that. All right, so all of us have grown children by now. And what is the takeaway from them of your household in the food area? What is their favorite dish that they're making for their family that it, that points back to you? Think about it. My son likes to cook, but he doesn't really cook anything Hungarian. It's, it's mostly American type foods, burgers and you know salmon and that kind of thing. Okay. And what about his wife? No wife. No wife. Okay. And June, what about you? Both my daughters like to cook and um, they both like to uh, bake a little one more than the other. And I would say my daughter who likes to bake will, will make uh, a lot of the things that I bake like uh, banana bread and uh, honey cake. 
um, when she uh, had the holiday recently, when she did a um, uh, holiday for her uh, husband's family, she made, you know, a couple of those same kind of dishes that I make uh, basic, uh, a good roast chicken and so on. My other daughter makes salmon 24-7. I, I think my granddaughter is going to grow gills. I mean, they, they just love <laughs> salmon. And so um, that that's really, uh, I, I cooked when they were young, but probably not to the same extent. I think, you know, young mothers, you're busy, you're working, you're raising children, you're running a household and, and uh, our, our roles were differently defined then. And uh, you didn't have the luxury of having as much time and, and un uncluttered space and unfettered time to actually prepare a meal the same way that I have the advantage now that I can, you know, that I can do that. So I certainly cook way more now that they're older than I, than I did when they were much younger. And Diana? Diana, your, ch your children take, have a takeaway from your cooking? They've, they've improved on my recipes and added their own spices to um, chicken curry, to roast beef, to latkes. They're still working on latkes. I'm the only one so far that makes the best ones. I always add carrots for color. Um, mostly um, they've invented their own recipes from mine. Nice. And what about you, Ava? Your children? My children, if they ask for recipes, so they grew up with my parents. So they they somehow, they learned the Ashkenazi uh, way of cooking, but it's the Sephardic food that they love, the appetizers and other things, the stuffed zucchini or my son's favorite, every birthday I have to stuffed zucchini and and this kind of thing mostly the middle eastern appetizers you have any daughters i have one daughter who is not a very she cooks very little but two sons who love to cook and are very good cooks nice and and one daughter-in-law who always asks for recipes and she does a great job and go back to you mark keith what would keith say about his uh, his uh, mom's cooking. Well, his mother is English, and she's a chocolate holic. So anything with chocolate is loved. But my son also loves lox. Okay, and I'm surprised no one has mentioned lox, but he absolutely loves lox. So whenever we get together, we always have to have a lox cream cheese. You know, a schmear, onion, a tomato, and of course a bagel. But those are now American foods. So what can I tell you? What kind of bagel? All everything bagel or no, usually it's a plain bagel or an onion bagel. You know? It, in Florida, it's kind of hard to get a you know good New York bagel. Really? But yeah, we have Brooklyn water bagel, and they they advertise that they uh, make it with Brooklyn water. So that's about as close as we get. I love that, and we also can make an egg cream. So I'm going to say in in the book that I wrote about iconic New York Jewish food, um, Brooklyn water bagel was my only example of. Where are you? Are you in Florida, Central Florida, Central the villages? Florida. So um, it, uh, there's one near my dad in in uh, West Palm. And okay. they are they are the only bagel outside of New York that I can truly say has the same um, proprietary water system as New York. It is not a misconception. The Smithsonian Institute analyzed the water that goes into New York foods, pizza crusts and bagels. And because it comes down from the Catskill Mountains, it picks up certain minerals that react in, in a particular way chemical way with uh, the ingredients that make dough, whether it's the yeast, it's the salt, it's the, so there really is something special, the minerality in the New York water and Brooklyn water bagel took those minerals, had them um, analyzed and then built a filtration system in their bagel shops. And they take the Florida water and they truly treat it the way New York 
city water is treated from the Catskill Mountains and um, their bagels come very close. They're hand rolled, they're baked on a plank, they're covered with a burlap and they are really, they mimic very closely New York bagels. It actually became an insult in the early 1900s. If you called somebody, if you wanted to um, uh, make a slur against a Jewish friend that you felt had over assimilated uh, to American culture, you would call them, oh, you're just lox and bagels, because that was considered uh, a, a derogatory expression um, to deride a Jewish family who has um, overly embraced American culture. I got a question for you. You never once mentioned kosher. Does that ever come into play in your recipes? Or have no. you ever had anybody question you about that? Yes, yeah, so every all of the recipes in Food, Hope, and Resilience are kosher, out of respect to the Holocaust survivor community. I they would I would not not have them all kosher, and um, I, it's never been questioned because they are tested and they are strictly kosher. I actually made a mistake in a book that I wrote called The Kosher Carnivore which I actually had a a, uh, a line that I added in a recipe that would have made the dish non-kosher. And it was, uh, we just didn't catch it. And it was something that I wrote by accident in a recipe for, in a chicken dish. But um, Food, Hope and Resilience is completely kosher as is iconic New York Jewish food. They're both, all the recipes are kosher. In your stories, did you ever... Have anyone said that kosher was important during the Holocaust? So, uh, that, it's always been something I've wondered about because no. in the blood ghetto, they were feeding on potato peels right. or anything they could dig up in the ground. Correct. Why don't you, why don't you bring, everyone be... in the, bring everyone in the loop? You mentioned the blood ghetto. How does that re relate to your family? You asking so, Mark? I'm asking Mark because you brought up the blood ghetto. So not everyone here knows how that relates to your family. Well, yeah, well, my parents, you know, my mother had like uh, seven brothers and sisters, and I never met my grandparents. Uh, only one brother, one sister survived, and they were in the, you know, they were in the Ludge ghetto. We don't know how anybody died in the family at all. Uh, but what in doing my research for my books, which I which are called the Devil's Bookkeepers, for the first time in my life, I understood how you know how hungry they were, how they were deprived of food and fuel, and they were ravaged by disease. And so when I, you know, when June is talking about food and how important it is, I never understood that as a child. As I said, now I do. Okay. Yes, and it, it was interesting because I would say that most of the survivors are kosher now. They were not all strictly kosher during the war. They ate anything and everything they could get their hands on. Yeah, I would think so. You know, yeah. I mean, it just it, it wasn't. And I think they felt rightfully so that um, the most important thing is to survive and you do whatever you have to do to survive. So you uh, you mentioned earlier earlier about uh, visiting, you know, communities. I want to put you in touch with Mark and Mark, you can probably put your email address in. So you pick it up. And by the way, the, the chat, all the chat uh, information will be available to you, June and everyone. Uh, it'll be on jcrnow.com along with That's the great. It will be uh, loaded up uh, and streaming tomorrow. But um, Mark lives in a community uh, in Florida, which has about 100,000 um, members in that community. What's it called? 50,000 active retirees. Yeah. Okay. So, so what, what, what community are you in, Mark? Can I ask? The villages, Florida. Oh, you are. Oh, okay. It's, 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 it's like its own County. It's a city. It is. It really it's is. A it's the fastest growing city in the United States. Yeah. Well, yeah. I would be thrilled to come and speak at the villages. Thrilled. Really? We'll talk. Okay. <laughs> I'll have my people call you. People. Okay. <laughs> coming to, the, coming to the, the end of the program, and I do want to have a, an exit. Uh, I want to thank you, June, for a lovely program. And I want to thank all of you for participating uh, in the second half of this program. I think it makes it so much special to have everyone's thoughts and memories and memories of food and our parents and the, whether you can laugh or whether you can cry, it's all very, very special. And you brought us a special program. 
that a lot of people from the recording will also get the benefit of. I'm going to also uh, let you know that our next event is on January 10th, and we have the producer, uh, Jackie uh, Kamash, with us. I'm going to share the trailer uh, of, of Jackie's film, We Are the Tree of Life, Carry On, and I'm super excited to announce today, and I'm open so pray, that Peter Yarrow uh, uh, will be joining us for that event. Uh, yeah. Peter is Peter, Paul, and Mary, and he will be uh, he will be brought uh, uh, with uh, Jackie and some some other friends of Jackie's to the program. So I'm going to play the trailer. You'll enjoy it, and I hope that you'll sign up. Uh, the links are on uh, both the Facebook page for the group and jcrnow.com. So let me share my screen, and we'll say um, we'll play the trailer now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. In those days, music notes were silent. On this day, the music will be heard. There is a place that is marked in the music that I've never seen in music before tumultuoso. È enorme le cose di adrenalina con le quali si può sopravvivere a situazioni di disagio, a situazioni tragiche, penose. But from her, we can kind of take her story and use it as a source of strength. And we those days, drawings were hidden and invisible. On this day, they will be seen. Helga's drawings are known throughout the world and are documented in the book, Draw What You See. We must tell the story of Friedel Dicker Brandeis and the art of the children of Terezin. On these days, literature was voiceless. On this day, life stories, words, and poetry will be heard. The last, the very last, butterflies don't live in here, in the ghetto. Carry on, my sweet survivor. Carry on, my lonely friend. I'm thinking of the richness of the interviews you've done at the USC Shoah Foundation and how you have captured experiences from multiple genocides and how that might inform our thinking about of a community building, we are the tree of life kind of effort. The Holocaust survivors themselves have had the final word of their own story. That to me is uh, an amazing act of both resilience, I'm gonna keep living and I'm going to tell my story and resistance, I have the final word on this. We collectively have the final word on this. So I hope you'll all join us for that beautiful film. We'll be streaming the full film live on January 10th, which is a Wednesday. Listen, have a happy rest of your holiday season. Happy New Year. We'll see you on the other side. Thank you again, June, for a terrific presentation. Love you all, my friends. And we'll and see the recording will be streaming tomorrow on YouTube. And you have to so say, much. ask us in to hide. Need in good health. Thank, Thank you, you, all of you. Thank you. Thank Bye you. Now.